I am here with an old friend, not old in age, but someone I've known for a little while. Hello, Jude. Hello. Possibly old in both senses, but hey, well, that's all good. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, footy mouth at the start isn't great, is it? <laughs> Hello, Jude. Yes, I've known her for a little while. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few things today, but how are you doing today? I'm all right, thank you. Yeah, it's a nice uh, sunny day down here in Cambridgeshire, and I've packed everyone off to school. I've got my coffee and uh, your smiling face on the screen, so yes. we're all good to go. Cool. I finished my first coffee, so I'm looking forward to a second. Not too <laughs> far in the future. Um, right, so we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, but one of the things is, let me get this right, um, a noise, a noise which is one of the things you're doing at the moment. If we talk about that first, and we can talk about how on earth that came about in the first place, but what's A Noise, A Noise all about? So, a Noise, A Noise is my family show in development, as in A Noise, as in boof, A Noise, people. Arr! So A Noise, A Noise obviously gives away by the title, I love playing with words, as you will know from previous experience of radios and quizzes and things. So um, A Noise A Noise is a family show. I call it a poetry show for all the senses. It's, um, it's a performance that has poems in it, some songs, lots of silliness and a few moments of beautiful hush. So it's all about the sounds of language and the language of sounds and it's accessible for all sorts of people. Um, anyone age six plus will find something in there to sort of enjoy really. What I love I love playing with language and I love freeing other people to enjoy and play with language too. So that's what the show's all about. Uh, we have fun. So uh, my middle son really loves words, grammar, spelling, being correct. And um, he had a conversation about the, the Oxford comma or something. I'm thinking it's a comma. Well, it has a name now. Um, but anyway, we were doing some conversation and, and the word conflation came up into it, which is a real word. So then I sort of, because I like to have fun with him, said, oh, well, it's a bit like deconflation. And then there's a little twitch because it's not a real word. Well, of course, <laughs> at that point, then we use deconflation loads now because we all know what it means. We know it's going to annoy him. So we use deconflation, even though it's not even a real word. Oh, well, that's interesting because in the show, I say how much I love words and I list some of the words that I love. And then it turns out that some of them are not technically words. <laughs> so there is something, isn't there, about love? I love some of the rules as well. I'm not an Oxford comma user, I have to say, <laughs> partly because I come from Cambridge, but I do understand what one is. Um, but yeah, I love I love some of the rules and I love, um, you know, I love being good at spelling, but also I love it when you can then deconflate or corrupt or mess around with language and make it wrong. And I point out in the show how sometimes when you get things wrong, it's actually more interesting and more entertaining. I remember, um, I've forgotten who it was. It was a, a, a lady author who was very, very well known, but she was talking about the way children are taught to read and write and it's all perfectly correct. She said, the problem is when you're doing, you know, writing a book, you don't always want to use correct because sometimes the incorrect is the funny or it's the hook for the point or it's it's the serious bit and you you use incorrect language as a way of extremely making a point. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the most creative writers will obey the rules 90% of the time, but then will do something possibly even just a tiny little, um, you know, rearranging the words or a slightly different take on a word and it can absolutely jump out at you, can't it? Um, I do like the fact that in your show you have a moment of hush, which we all need in this world, don't we? We need those moments of calm. Yeah. So it works really well, actually. People would think you've got a room full of families and loads of kids. How on earth are you going to actually keep them quiet? But it comes about two thirds of the way through the show. So we've established lots of rapport by then. And I just start talking about space and how we don't really notice space, do we? But if we didn't have space, where would we ever go? <laughs> so, and then we start talking about what noise space makes and space doesn't make noise. It makes silence and whether silence is a noise or not. And then we do, we sit very quietly and I, um, I read a, a short um, poem with lots of gaps in it, all about silence and noticing noises when you go quiet. It's, it's quite beautiful, actually. Um, these things, it's, it's worth having a go and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But this, this really has worked in the show. So, um, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. For people who perhaps haven't heard of Jude Simpson, um, I mean, you're doing you're doing this this stage thing with a noise, a noise. But what I like to go back a bit in time. What, how, why, how did you get into that bit? <laughs> What's the backstory of that? Sure. So, um, so I am a spoken word performer. So that means I write poetry, but I write poetry for performance rather than just for the page. Um, I I was doing it for years and years before having a family. Then I had quite a few years out, four children plus COVID. Uh, meant that I had a bit of an extended career break from the stage, though I was still writing. 
So um, I previous to that, I did three runs at the Edinburgh Festival. I toured a solo show of spoken word and song. Um, I did lots of gigs. I won some slam competitions, that kind of thing. So uh, about three years ago, I came back kind of properly committed, able with the, the age that my children are able to, um, you know, commit to performance and, and touring and things again. So that's been brilliant. And I've always written stuff that's family friendly. I write lots of whimsical, quirky, fun things to do with rhymes and wordplay, like we've said. Um, but I thought, well, why don't I write actually specifically for family audiences? And it was only a small pivot, really. But I started with um, a, there was a little 10 minute showcase. I belong to uh, an artist development programme at the, my local theatre in Cambridge, Cambridge Junction, and they were putting on a little scratch night. So I did 10 minutes just trying out some of the material that I'd written and people loved it. And immediately after that, the producer came to me and said, can you do a half hour performance in the spring? Wow. Of course I said yes. And then the next morning I woke up and went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wrote up to, yeah, the half an hour of the show, which is quite, you know, which is a substantial show. And I performed that in May and that went well as well, but there were loads of things I still wanted to change. So basically the show's been in development. I performed a full length version of it at a festival, um, Greenbelt Festival in August. And I did another full length uh, just a couple of weeks ago at a local literature festival um, for a family audience there. So um, yeah, so now the show's kind of close to being ready. Um, I've just won some funding to help me finish developing it and start touring it. So that's really exciting. So that's with uh, a theatre in Peterborough called the Key Theatre. So they're supporting me to kind of finish the show, get it really nicely wrapped up as a beautiful piece of theatre. And they're going to help me um, contact venues. And I think people don't always realise if you're not famous or on telly, you've got a lot to give. And I really believe in this show and audiences have loved it so far. Um, but it's not automatic. And the world of live theatre is really still suffering since the pandemic. So it's not easy to take a, t um, a show on tour. But there is a lot of market for family theatre, which is great. So it's about identifying the venues that want to put this kind of show on that are the right sort of size and um, getting some contacts, making some phone calls, that kind of thing. So the show is will be ready for touring from February 2025. I've got a lovely, um, a lovely trailer on YouTube that we made. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all kind of in progress. So I'm very excited. So if any of your listeners know of little theatres up to kind of about two, 200, 250 in capacity, um, then give me a shout. I can wing out my tour pack to you and we can get into negotiations. <laughs> Cool. That's, that's so exciting. I, I don't know how theatre works apart from people get on a stage and do something. Um, that that's, that's that's my limit. Uh, but <laughs> I, I can also imagine there's an awful lot that has to go on in terms of, of not just turning up, but that people need to be at the door. There needs to be flyers. There needs to be tickets. And there, there's so many things. But you're getting help with that, which which is awesome. Yeah. No, it's really good because, as you can imagine, I'm really not a visual person. So something like designing a poster or getting images is so key to putting over your brand and the feel of the show. But uh, I mean, I'm absolutely flawed on that kind of thing. So I've worked with a great photographer. I've worked with a really good designer. Um, and now, as we say, I've got this funding to work with some, um, probably work with a director a little bit and uh, yeah, and all the admin stuff as well. So that's all good. Yeah. So I can hopefully just do my bit, which is the words and the performance. <laughs> We we all have these gifts to bring. I, I absolutely believe this, that, that we all have something that's amazing, that's kind of unique to us. But we also need people who can help us in what we're doing as I help them. And, and all of a sudden it builds and grows and becomes this amazing thing of Jude Simpson on a stage doing a family show. Yeah. I went to a seminar recently <clears throat> and uh, there was a solo theatre maker there and she said, there's no such thing as a solo performer. And it's such an obvious thing to say, <laughs> but until you hear someone say it, it doesn't really click. But, you know, there are so many people that just that just help out and, and bring their gifts, like you say, mm. um, so that, yeah, to, to make it work, really. Cool. OK, let's go back in time just a bit further then. So you, you're discovering you have this this talent, this ability to write stuff for the for performance rather than just being read. Yeah. How did that come about? How did, did, I mean, is it one of those you write some <laughs> jokes and somebody says, oh, that's really funny. And then you think, oh, I could make a living out of this. How did that happen? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the making a living out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a funny one, isn't it? I, I, and I don't totally know is really the answer. But I'll tell you something interesting is that my brother also writes funny poems. Uh, so whether there's a funny poem gene floating around 
in us. I don't know, but it's very interesting. He's um, a teacher, but he gets called on every time someone has, um, you know, a special occasion or someone's leaving, he will put together a, a comical poem for them and perform it. So it's very interesting, the innate um, giftings we have. But I, um, I suppose I, the first time I remember doing something is when I was um, sharing a house in London when I was in my 20s and some of my housemates were from New Zealand and they were leaving. So I wrote a funny poem with all the funny stories and things that had happened and thought, oh, this is quite good. But people came and, and just said that was absolutely amazing. It was so good and, and sort of, you know, appreciated it more than I expected. Hmm. Um, I was a civil servant after I graduated because I didn't really know what to do with my life. And actually, the civil service is a fantastic grounding for being a good writer because you're producing. I was producing policy papers and submissions to ministers and letters about uh, from MPs and things like that. And you really have to get good, concise, meaningful writing. But I kind of knew there was something creative in me. I'd always loved dancing, um, but it was like I wanted to dance with words, if that doesn't sound too cheesy. That makes sense in my head. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> um, so basically, I saved up some money as a, as a single person in London, and I took some time off work just to explore. I didn't want to get to the end of my life and think, I wonder if I could have made it. I also didn't want to, you know, I wanted to know if I was good enough and could do something I wanted to find out. And if I wasn't good enough, that was fine. So I tried various things. I tried writing for magazines. I tried writing stories. I tried some stand up comedy and I tried the poetry and it was the poetry that really took off very slowly. <laughs> I went to an open mic night in London in Covent Garden, Betterton Street, the poetry cafe. It was called Tuesday nights, I think. Um, and then from there, you know, you'd have five minutes each. And when I'd done that a few times, someone came and said, oh, do you want to come and do my poetry gig in Brixton? You know, 10 minutes and I'll give you five quid kind of thing to cover the tube fare. Um, and then it, yeah, from there, it just quietly, slowly grew. Um, I think it's a mixture, isn't it, of, of honing your craft and making sure you're really good at what you do. And it's very much you and you're making sure you do the, the unique stuff that's really authentic to yourself. Um, and then also putting yourself out there, being brave, being courageous, doing the marketing, putting yourself forward. So yeah, so it grew from there really. And then as I say, I developed um, more and more gigs, developed a solo show, took it up to Edinburgh and then did that two year, three years running um, and started having a little a little tour of that show uh, based on the, the Edinburgh performances. I love how you 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 explored possibilities from stand-up to, to poetry and other stuff as well. I'm thinking, well, which one of these do I kind of fit best in because it's good to explore it really is yeah it is and and we have to give ourselves permission to make mistakes don't we and I think oh, that yes. was you know a, something like stand-up comedy I, I really admire stand-up comics because your mistakes are so immediate and so public you know <laughs> everyone who is brilliant at stand-up comedy has died many times on stage um, and that's just part of it. So yeah, I wanted to try different things because I didn't know my, no one in my family is a writer, no one's a performer. I didn't know anything about the whole setup or that that life really. So I needed to experiment a bit. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So where where does faith fit into this? Because um, I, I know that you have a relationship with God. So how did that, I mean, where's, where's that in amongst all of, all of the writing? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, I've always had a Christian faith. And that's always been quite central to me. But um, equally, I am, um, so I belong to a fantastic organization called the Association of Christian Writers, which is loads of people that write all sorts of different things, but they all have a Christian faith. Um, but I actually struggle to describe myself as a Christian writer because it feels somehow constraining or, or very um, sort of purposeful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I don't think my writing is very purposeful. Maybe that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I think what I mean is um, my faith affects and and informs my life. And my life is me and me is what I put into my poetry. So I don't write poems trying to persuade people to believe in God, for example. But I do write poems that have a lot of joy and a lot of belief and a, a sense of hope in them, I think. Um, I also I do love writing uh, writing poems about Christmas, for example, or about inspired by the Bible. Um, but but that's me that's me exploring. It's part of my ex exploration of faith. 
Hmm. So I did a poem um, two years ago called Holy and Lowly about the angels and the shepherds and how on Christmas cards, the angels at Christmas are very much up in the sky and the shepherds are down here on earth. But um, I read in one of the gospels in the Bible, it said the angels appeared among them. And I got really excited about that sense of the angels not being up there, but actually suddenly turning around and there's an angel next to you who starts <laughs> singing <laughs> in full throated gospel. <laughs> Um, so it's those little things about my own faith that excite me and inspire me. And then I sort of, yeah, I turn those into poems. Um, but I don't, I'd be interested to know whether people would listen to that poem and go, oh, it's a Christian poem or whether they would just go, oh, this is a poem about the way someone thought about the shepherds and the angels in the Christmas story. So, uh, yeah, faith is always there. Um, but it's not sort of. It's not it's not there in the same way that sometimes people expect it to be. And sometimes people say to me, do you do the same material at churches that you would like in a stand up comedy gig? Because I do a whole range of performances when I'm gigging. And generally the answer is yes, because I do what I do and I am who I am. Um, and whether it's a church or not a church, in a sense, what I say to myself is God is always there present in the room when I'm performing. So it's not like, oh, I'll do this while God's not there. And then when I go to a church, I'll do something <laughs> different. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but that is the answer. <laughs> no, but I think it's good though, because when you are yourself authentically, that's mm. the bit that comes out. And if you try and be different people in different places, eventually you start to struggle to think, what am I supposed to be in this particular space or that space? But I'm reminded of the US um, singer Lecrae, who was quite candid at one point. I'm not a Christian artist, I'm a Christian who happens to be a hip hop artist. And yes, they both influence both worlds. Yeah. But if he was just a Christian hip hop artist, then he couldn't do what he does do, which is to reach so many people who don't know about God. Yeah. And I think the thing is, as well, as soon as you say you're a Christian artist, people expect that you have drawn conclusions and you're presenting your conclusions. And actually, art and, and writing are all about exploration. And I think that's why we sometimes kick against the label, because... I'm not there saying, right, I've discovered everything and here I am to tell you the truth about God, faith and the world. You know, that would just be ridiculous and it would constrain my creativity. What I'm here to do is is share my perspective and tell you about things that I've discovered and things that have made me laugh along the way. Um, so, yeah, I think it's yeah, we sometimes just shy away from being labelled as Christian artists and I, and I really understand why. I, I love that. I mean, I, here on the, on the radio, we, we don't play Christian music. We don't play secular music. We don't play mainstream. We play music. <laughs> yeah. And some of those artists might try to describe themselves as Christians and some of them might not. But I just care about the music. I don't really yeah. care about the rest of the stuff. Not me. You know, that's that's just my take on it. And I love the music. And that's the bit that, that moves us in the same way that I would say that your words, it's the words that move people. And mm -hmm. I mean, I love that Holy Lowly one. I, I, I remember that. And it's brilliant <laughs> because it puts a perspective on it that I never considered. And that's what I love about what art, like poetry can do. I'm not even a poetry fan, but I loved this. It was brilliant. Good. Was Thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe should I do a little snatch of one of my Annoys Annoys poems for I you? I think you should. I think we need to. So, so this is um, one of the poems at the top of the show. And it's all about things which are or aren't named after the sound they make. Or the things they do. It's called dingers and poppers. Dingers always ding and poppers always pop. Bleepers bleep and beepers beep and plopping things go plop. Clippers always clip but horses clip and clop. Pips can pop right out and you can watch a drip drop. <laughs> Flippers clap together making flappy sounds of joy but slippers stop you slipping and make very little noise. Many things go boom, especially when they burst. But if you want to dong, you have to ding first. Ding dong. There you go. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> a little snatch. So you can get a feel of the show. It's just all about digging around words and concepts and ideas um, and, and messing them around. Yeah. See, the reason why I wouldn't do what you do is manifold. One of them is I would get them wrong. I would get the wrong <laughs> sang or the wrong order. And I end, end up saying something probably, you know, I get sued for because I'd get the wrong word because it, you've got to be really clear with, with words addiction. And I think it's like the, the dong with the ding getting it because we always say ding dong, don't we? Yeah. It, it's that's what I would get that wrong. And it yeah. wouldn't be funny for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> we do quite a lot of tongue twisters in the show as well. And, and, um, 
if I do a longer version, so when I take it on tour, they'll either be a straightforward um, kind of all the way through show, or you have an interval and the second half involves lots of audience participation and people can come up and have a go at tongue twisters and how many times they can say it without making a mistake. And like you say, the funniest thing is when it all goes wrong. <laughs> See, snooker and tongue twisters to me are the same. I like snooker. I'm awful at it. And I love <laughs> tongue twisters and I'm dreadful, but it's good fun. And sometimes it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. It's having some fun. And it's like you yeah. said, it's that joy, which we so much need. And, yeah. you know, if you get it wrong, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of joy in the show. That's for sure. People definitely come out with a smile on their face. And yeah. But that's what we need. We need joy. And I love the fact it's, it's you know, you're making this for, for six, six and up. Um, I remember I was doing a church service one time and I said, you know, uh, this this is for people who are aged eight to 80. And in that church that one morning, there was a, a young boy of eight and there was an old lady of 80. Mm. And they, they basically said, I'm, eight, I'm 80. And it was really nice to see that kind of, well, I made, I made it as a line, but it was nice to actually have an eight-year-old and it's an 80 real. who said, we love this. It was great. Yeah. So it's nice when that happens. Well, one of the things I'm actually quite passionate about as well is that sometimes when we have children we kind of pack them off to do an activity while we stay and do something else on the sidelines so you know obviously for a swimming lesson that's kind of unavoidable or whatever <laughs> but i really think it's a shame when we're constantly separating and there aren't many opportunities actually for parents and kids to actually socialize together mm. so there's lots more family festivals and things coming up that's definitely an improvement but um i love it when adults and children all as a family experience something together so that's why this is really a family show rather than a children's show it's not somewhere where you pack off your six-year-olds and go and have a drink until they come out again it's something you sit in together and there's some lines that the adults get more than the kids there's some lines that the kids love more than the adults and everyone can then experience it together go and talk about it together make up their own tongue twisters together and it becomes a whole you know, a whole shared experience that can carry on into family life. I love that. And we need more of that. <laughs> well, let's hope lots of people think that. Andy. <laughs> I do. I will, I will keep banging on about that. We used to all age services and uh, I would always say everyone comes in together. Oh, it's for children. No, no, this is for everybody. Literally 80 to 80. And uh, we'd yeah. have people in their 80s saying, oh, I love what you said there. Or we'd have a six year old and the parents said, why are they sitting still? Well, probably because we're not making them sit still for too long. That was. Yeah key we stand yeah. up and sit down the anglicans they're very good at ah, managing people aren't they stand up sit I've down i've never thought of that yes so you're always moving on to something yeah. else it is it's a challenge when there are children in the audience because yeah. they haven't developed that kind of social nicety <laughs> where you think to yourself this is getting a bit boring but i'll sit politely and still watch and listen yeah. <laughs> they don't do that at all i love so that got to be you don't have to be frenetic no. they don't want that no. but you've got to always have something that's being offered haven't you yeah no definitely um right now you and i met on a quiz steve leg was central to that and we cannot not touch on yeah steve leg the, the bringer of friendships and connections i was chatting to a guy yesterday and I thought, this is Steve Legg still. This is a guy who I was introduced to by Dr. Richard Scott, GP, who I was introduced to by Steve Legg. Yeah. And I'm still seeing connections going on because that's what he did. He brought people together and brought them together with joy. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And as you are I don't know if you'll remember, but I, I always used to do a poem on that show once a week. I do. I, and uh, the the quiz of the week and I would sort of reflect on some of the things we chatted about in the previous episode and one of them was literally all about Steve Legg and his friendships and it was I can't remember exactly it was called something like Steve Legg knows everybody and everybody knows Steve <laughs> Legg and you know you go and visit your great auntie and it turns out she's just bought Steve's book or she knows him through a friend or whatever it is so he did have that incredible ability to make friends to keep friends and to just to nudge things so that they happened. I mean, you've, you've got a project, you've got a book project at the moment, I think, that, that Steve helped to kindle with you. Yeah. Um, our, our friend Andy Godfrey wrote a book that Steve encouraged him and really got yeah. him actually doing it, turning the idea into a reality. Um, I wrote this book with Steve just um, early this year, 31 Bedtime Prayers and Poems, and it was Steve's idea. And he said, oh, you know, I think we should do this. And do you want to help me write the poems? And shall we do? And he brought in an illustrator. Um, and, yet, and and even now, the illustrator um, has got in touch with me just recently and said, oh, if you ever have another project you want to to work on together, let me know. And and it's all it is. It's that it's that ability that Steve had to, to bring people together and to see their gifts and to join things up and to and also to just let things go. And, and there was so much energy that came 
from him out into the rest of us that that made things happen i don't know how many hours of whatsapp messages we had some days just back and forth um <laughs> but it struck me as i think this was quite normal because one night it's about 10 30 at night i hadn't turned my phone off a message came in on whatsapp and it made the whatsapp noise and joe said oh is that steve again <laughs> and that maybe illustrates something of the relationship we had but um yeah it, it, he he just encouraged and that's what i'm wanting to live on because he encouraged me so much when i first said steve i think we want to do a radio station brilliant excited so amazing encouragement and he just pushed and pushed and pushed encouragement at us when i was wavering he'd say keep going it's good um and uh it that that's who he was spring harvest last year 2023 we're down in minehead and everybody i spoke to on all the different stands said something about steve i never talked to them about steve but they just opened with oh isn't steve leg great and that's every trader that i met at spring harvest and yeah. that was who steve leg was it really was um, and i believe you've written something for him well you know when you're when you're a writer it's how you process things really and um two things about steve i mean steve was such a brilliant entertainer in so many ways um and also everything he did we've talked about faith just now but but everything he did was like he just wanted to be an echo of the glorious loving nature of god that that he believed in so strongly so um yeah i kind of wrote this piece i don't know whether it's even finished but um yeah this is me sort of reflecting on steve shall we give it a go so i've called it in good time uh, in memory of steve leg the escapologist has made the ultimate escape the speaker has said all he needed to say the comedian has told his last anecdote and the magician has disappeared, slipping behind the curtain. We had a few encores, but now there's nothing but an empty treasure purse of a body confirming both how present he was and how absent he now is. Always leave them wanting more, Jude. Where Steve was concerned, it was always a good time. Always ready with a bubbling hot tub, a bottle of wine, a roast dinner and lengthy instructions on exactly how to cook your roast dinner. Always a new story, a favourite old story, a sparkle of conversation, latest news of family swelling with pride until it oozed out of you and threatened to drip down onto those shirts. Those shirts. Oh, those endless shirts. The inexhaustibility of your joy if we're honest, sometimes bordered on the exhausting. But if you're properly plumbed into the very source of all that is joyful, and if with his help you've waded through pains and sadnesses and learnt to live overcoming without denying all of them, then of course you smile and nothing can conquer you. Every stranger was a new friend, every friend a new colleague, every colleague a potential project, every project another chance to reflect the glory of your maker, because it all served his purpose. Every sentence written was a tiny echo of the word that was in the beginning. Every escape you performed was a minute reflection of that boundless freedom bought by Jesus that you lived in. Every magic trick was the tiniest glimmer of that divine, mind-blowing transaction that, in just three days, disappeared the permanence of death itself and with a flourish of angels opened a rocky box to reveal everlasting life. Goodbye, Steve. You always did love being ahead of the curve, but we'll all catch up with you someday. In good time. Wow. That um, that was amazing. Thank you. <sighs> and that that, but that is life. That that it it's not always going to be happy. There's going to be the joy, and there's going to be the sadness. There's going to be the celebration. There's going to be the mourning. Um, but you just summed up so much of of who I knew of him. But what I love is I didn't know all of him, and everyone knew parts of him, and he yeah. he shared that with people, and that's. I think when I, when I'm thinking, what can I take forward? It's just, I want to encourage people. I want to continue to encourage people yeah. um, and, and to build them up where I can, because that's, that's the gift I saw him give to others. And that's a gift he, he gave to me as well. So, and that, um, that's his legacy then, isn't it? To that, that inspiration and that desire to encourage people. Yeah. There's so much 
competitiveness and there's so much rivalry so much self doubt in in kind of creative things and, and media careers and things like that and and steve sort of transcended all that and just always affirmed people um and if we could yeah if we could all do a bit of that um it would do all of us good and and do those whole those whole sectors good wouldn't it um amen to that Let's encourage and build. There's enough being torn down. Let's build each other up and encourage and joy. Um, have you got a website, Jude, that people can come and find out more about you? I certainly have. Yeah, judesimpson.co.uk is my website. And social media, you'll find me, uh, Jude Simpson Words, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, there's even a dedicated page for A Noise A Noise um, on Facebook, which I've just set up. So if people would like to go and like that and have a little look around that and maybe make some comments, that would be really appreciated to get that sort of uh, get that going a little bit cool we will share that with the when we put this video out later um jude thank you it's a delight talking to you it always is you just <laughs> you just you have a way of i don't know just just illustrating life with color that perhaps we missed thank you that's a beautiful thing to say i'll take that thanks very much it's been lovely to be here with you excellent um jude thank you so much for that poem as well we're, we're going to separate that and put that out we've, we've done that with Andy godfrey did a tribute dr richard scott gp did a tribute and 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 your poem as well we're going to put these out um separately anyway um so thank you for that um obviously this video will go out later today jude simpson thank you very much you are welcome have a great day <laughs>